Hello students, welcome to Statics. I'm Dr. Stewart and today we're going to do an example for shear and bending moment diagrams. This example is example 7.1 coming from Hibbler's Statics book. In this example, we're asked to draw the shear and moment diagrams for the given beam. Let's analyze this beam so we have an understanding of what's going on. The beam is subjected to an external loading, which is a distributed load. This distributed load is not constant. Instead, it starts at zero and it rises to a maximum value of six kilonewtons per meter. The beam is supported by a pin connection at point A and a roller at point B. These supports, they're going to need to be replaced with reactions. Let's create a free body diagram taking this structure and freeing it from its constraints. In our free body diagram, we're going to replace the pin on the roller with reactions. A reaction AY at A and a reaction BY at B. Some of you might ask, why isn't there a reaction AX? since the support we have at A is a pin. That's because we have no external loading in the X direction. And so AX is going to be zero. All right. So now that we've done that, um, we're gonna wanna try to section this body. And that section would be a section somewhere in the middle so that we could expose normal forces, shear forces, and bending moments, and then figure out what their uh, values are as a function of distance. Before we do that, however, since the unknown AY is on the left-hand side and the unknown BY is on the right-hand side, since we, have two, since we have unknowns on both sides of the section, we're going to need to solve for AY and BY first. So, to do that, let's replace this distributed load with a single concentrated force. We know for triangular distributed loads that the force resultant is equal to one half of base times height. So it's actually the, the volume, I mean, not the volume, but the area inside of the triangle. We also know that the location of that concentrated force is going to be at two-thirds the low side and one-third the high side. So with that knowledge, let's go ahead and create a, another version of our free body diagram. Here, in this version, we remove the distributed load, we replace it with our single concentrated force, we calculate it, and then we can use equations of equilibrium to solve for AY and BY. Let's do that real quick. We'll do uh, some of the forces, some of the moments about point A, and we'll do the sum of the forces in the Y direction. We find BY is equal to 18 kilonewtons, and AY is equal to 9 kilonewtons. All right. So now we know the supports, we know, the, we know the, the magnitude of those reactions at the supports. Now we can proceed with doing the method of sections. Now, we have a choice in doing our method of sections. We're going to section somewhere in the body in between A and B. We can choose either the left-hand side or the right-hand side. This choice is important. If we choose the side that is harder, then that means that we're going to have more complicated equations. We're going to have much more work to do. We don't want to do that. We want to choose the side that is going to be easier for us to solve. Which side do you think is easier to solve? So the side that's actually easier to solve in this problem is the left-hand side. 
And the reason is, if we were to take the right-hand side, then we would have to create a diagram that goes from a high value to some truncated lower value. So we're going to have to figure out this side of that, uh, of that section that we perform. And it might be a little bit challenging, right? Creating, figuring out that equation. So instead, let's take the left-hand side. So all we're working with is a building triangle as our, as our diagram. That is going to be much easier for us to work with. So we apply the method of sections to the left-hand side. We create a section on our free body diagram where we section the body and we expose the internal forces and moments. In this case, we have internal shear forces and bending moments. And we already realize that there are no normal forces that are going to be developing in this beam. There's no normal forces because there's no external forces in the X direction. All right, so let's go ahead and make this diagram. We are going to do this method of sections using a variable dimension. X is going to be a variable dimension. That way, if X is zero, this diagram applies. If X is the maximum value, this diagram would also apply. And that X is going to allow us to create an equation that describes how the shear forces change, so how V, function of X changes, and how M as a function of X changes. So we do that. We create this diagram. We replace the AY support with the actual value. We can figure out where the force resultant would be. It's going to be uh, one third of the high side, which is wherever X is. And uh, from this, uh, we can go ahead and make a calculation uh, for what do we think the force resultant term is going to be. Let's start with an equation for the distributed load. Because X is kind of changing whatever W is going to be, we need to define the distributed load W as a function of X. Now, the distributed load that we started with up here is six kilonewtons per meter. But we're going to be at some distance that, you know, isn't going to get us that full value of six kilonewtons per meter. So we have to figure out an equation that describes that. Well, when W is equal to zero, I mean, when, when, uh, when the X position is equal to zero, W is equal to zero. When the X position is equal to its maximum value of nine meters, then the distributed load is equal to six kilonewtons per meter. So we need to describe an equation that, that can, can match this relationship. And that equation is, is going to really arrive from this relationship here. If we plug in a nine for this X, we should result in a six kilonewtons. And to do that, we find that there must be a slope of two thirds to get us six kilonewtons per meter at the end of this beam. So we're just finding the slope. All right. So now that we have that distributed load, now as a function of position, we can then plug that in to finding the force resultant uh, for our problem, right? Now here we're doing the same thing. Uh, uh, um, we're saying the force resultant, uh, or, um, well actually, what we're really saying here is the force resultant is equal to one half of whatever W is as a, a function of X times the distance, the current distance we are over the beam, right? So if we follow this path, we've got our W as a function of X, we've added X there, so our force resultant as a function of X is going to be one-third X squared kilonewtons, right? Because it is the area inside of the triangle. And guess what? Height is the WX, 
the length is x, and then one half is going to get us that area. Okay. So we figured that out. Now let's take this information and take our free body diagram of the section, and let's create equations of equilibrium. Let's sum the forces in the y direction. When we do that, we'll find an equation arrives for the shear force. Let's sum the moments about the endpoint here of our diagram. When we do that, we'll find an equation for the bending moment as a function of x. So now we have everything that we need in order to create our um, shear force and bending moment diagrams. We've, just to, to review real quickly, we figured out what our reactions are, creating equations of equilibrium for those. We sectioned our body using a variable dimension, and we applied that variable dimension to the force resultant and to the distributed load functions for this diagram. And then finally, we created equations of equilibrium and then solved for the shear force equation and the bending moment equations. All right, let's create some diagrams. And let's, you know, let's, you know, put those equations here again in a succinct way that the shear force is a function of X and the bending moment as a function of X are as follows course, moment being kilonewtons times meters. So now let's draw the diagrams. Let's start with our free body diagram, but let's go ahead and replace that distributed load with the force resultant. And then let's below that put our shear force uh, diagram where we're plotting shear force as a function x of position, right? This line that we generate, this line that describes the shear force, that is actually the equation that we found from our equations of equilibrium. The equation for the shear force is a function of x. That's exactly what we're plotting. And the easiest way to do it for some of these more complicated problems, uh, take your calculator and use the plot feature, plug in the, uh, the equation, and then you'll get this nice plot that you can try to recreate on your, on your exams or your homeworks, right? And then what we can do is we can actually make a couple of checks to verify that these shear forces are developing the way we expect them. Uh, if x is equal to zero, we take that and plug that into our equation, we are going to find that the shear force is equal to nine kilonewtons. Well, is that correct? Well, if we're up nine kilonewtons, that's actually gonna to correspond to AY. So yes, that equation, that, that point is correct on our curve. Well, let's look at the X position, X equal to nine. Where, well, what happens when X is equal to nine? If we plug that in to our equation and X is equal to nine, we're going to find that V is equal to 18 kilonewtons. Well, well, how does that compare to our diagram? Uh, well, uh, if we plot it there, oh, I'm sorry, it should be uh, negative 18 kilonewtons. Well, when we plot it on our diagram, we have that negative 18. Well, guess what? In this diagram here, by is equal to 18. So that's gonna get us back to zero. So we started at zero, we went up nine, we end at zero. That tells us, seems like we're at a good location. Seems like we're, um, it seems like this diagram makes sense. And then finally, we may want to know where does the shear force become zero along our beam? How do we find that? Let's set shear force equal to zero in our equation. So let's set this equal to zero and solve for X. When we do that, we'll actually find the location, the distance 
at which the shear force passes uh, through zero. And that distance is 5.2 meters, right? So we can use this approach in figuring out, uh, you know, how or verifying that our equation actually makes sense. Now let's proceed with drawing the moment diagram for this problem. The moment diagram is moment as a function of distance. We have an equation for that. That equation is up here. We've solved for it. That describes how moment evolves as a function of x. If we look at this equation, we can see that it's a nonlinear equation, x cubed and an x term. This is going to be a complicated type of function. Um, for people who are knowledgeable, you can look at those terms. Oh, x cubed. I know what this is going to look like. But most people can't. So the best thing to do, let's take this function. Let's go ahead and plot it in our calculators. Most basic calculators can plot that. And let's evaluate multiple locations, multiple different x distances to see what shape will that take if our, if our calculators can't do it? So let's go down. We're going to plot this moment diagram directly below the shear force diagram. And as we move it down here, uh, what we'll, we'll start with is x equal to zero. When x is equal to zero, we plug in our equation. The moment is equal to zero. Okay. Then let's plot x is equal to 5.2. That would be the same location as where shear force is equal to zero. If we do that, we find that moment is a maximal value of 31.2 kilonewtons times meters. Okay. Now let's plot the last point on this beam, the distance of nine meters. We find that the moment is equal to zero. And so if we just were to plot those three points, we're going zero, to a maximal value and back to zero. Okay, it kind of makes sense because we want to go zero to zero, but how would we plot it? Well, let's take that equation, we plot it in, we see that we get this nonlinear line or this nonlinear function of the bending moment as a, as a function of x. All right, so now we've crafted the shear force and bending moment diagrams for this problem. Why are we making these diagrams? What is their value? Who cares? Their value is in telling us where along our beam are shear forces maximized and bending moments maximized. Because where those forces and moments are maximized, those are the locations that we're concerned with. Those are the locations where we believe cracks will initiate that failure will occur, where the most deflection may happen. So it's important for us to know where those locations are, right? All right, so we finished these examples for shear force and bending moment and moment diagrams. You can see that using the method of sections, it's gonna require us to make a lot of equations of equilibrium, and it's gonna, it's gonna take us a lot of work. In the next section, we're gonna learn how to exploit relationships between constant between distributed loads shear forces and bending moments and and using calculus to actually create these diagrams it is going to be easier in terms of setting it up but it will be a little bit more challenging because we got to do some calculus i'll see you in the next series of example videos i'm dr stewart see you next time